Book Two, Sailing to the Present. Something about the fate of souls. His bone white, long fingered hand upon a carved demon's head in black brown hardwood. One of the few such decorations to be found anywhere about the vessel. The tall man stood alone in the ship's forecastle and stared through large, slanting crimson eyes at the mist, into which they moved with a speed and sureness to make any mortal mariner marvel and become incredulous. There were sounds in the distance incongruous with the sounds of even this nameless, timeless sea. Thin sounds, agonized and terrible, for all that they remained remote. Yet the ship. Followed them as if drawn by them, they grew louder. Pain and despair were there, but terror was predominant. Elric had heard such sounds echoing from his cousin Yerkun's sardonically named pleasure chambers in the days before he fled the responsibilities of ruling all that remained of the old Melnibanean Empire. These were the voices of men whose very souls were under siege, men to whom death meant not mere extinction, but a Continuation of existence forever enthralled to some cruel and supernatural master. He had heard men cry so when his salvation and his nemesis, his great black battle blade Stormbringer, drank their souls. He did not savor the sound. He hated it. Turned his back away from the source and was about to descend the ladder to the main deck when he realized that Otto Blenker had come up behind him. Now that Coram had been borne off by friends with chariots which could ride on the surface of the water, Blenker was the last of those comrades to have fought at Elric's side against the two alien sorcerers, Gagak and Agak. Blenker's black, scarred face was troubled. The ex-scholar turned hireling sword covered his ears with his huge palms. Ah! By the twelve symbols of reason, Elric, who makes that din? It's as though we sail close to the shores of hell itself. Elric of Melnibene shrugged. I'd be prepared to forego an answer and leave my curiosity unsatisfied, Master Blenker. If only our ship would change course as it is, we sail closer and closer to the source. Blenker grunted his agreement. <sighs> I've no wish to encounter whatever it is that causes these poor fellows to scream so. Perhaps we should inform the captain. You think he does not know where his own ship sails? The tall black man rubbed at the inverted V-shaped scar which ran from his forehead to his jawbones. I wonder if he plans to put us into battle again. I'll not fight another for him. Elric's hand moved from the carved rail to the pommel of his rune sword. I have business of my own to attend to. Once I'm back on real land, a wind came from nowhere. There was a sudden rent in the mist. Now Elric could see that the ship sailed through rust-colored water. Peculiar lights gleamed in that water just below the surface. There was an impression of creatures moving ponderously in the depths of the ocean, and for a moment, Elric thought he glimpsed a white, bloated face, not dissimilar to his own, a Melnibanean face. Impulsively, he whirled back to the rail, looking past Blenker as he strove to control the nausea in his throat. For the first time since he had come aboard the dark ship, he was able clearly to see the length of the vessel. There were two great wheels, one beside him on the foredeck, one at the far end of the ship on the rear deck, tended now as always by the steersman, the captain's sighted twin. There was a great mast bearing the taut black sail, and fore and aft of this, the two deck cabins, one of which was entirely empty, its occupants having been killed during their last landfall. And one of which was occupied only by himself and Blenker. Elric's gaze was drawn back to the steersman, and not for the first time the albino wondered how much influence the captain's twin had over the course of the dark ship. The man seemed tireless, rarely, to Elric's knowledge, going below to his quarters, which occupied the stern deck, as the captain's occupied the fore deck. Once or twice, Elric or Blenker had tried to involve the steersman in conversation, but. He appeared to be as dumb as his brother was blind. The cryptographic geometrical carvings covering all the ship's wood and most of its metal, from sternpost to figurehead, were picked out by the shreds of pale mist still clinging to them. And again, Elric wondered if the ship actually generated the mist normally surrounding it. And as he watched, 
the design slowly turned to pale pink fire as the light from that red star which forever followed them permeated the overhead cloud. A noise from below. The captain, his long red-gold hair drifting in a breeze which Albert could not feel, emerged from his cabin. The captain's circlet of blue jade, worn like a diadem, had turned to something of a violet shade in the pink light, and his buff-colored hose and tunic reflected the hue. Even the silver sandals with their silver lacing glittered in the rosy tint. Again, Elric looked upon that mysterious blind face, as unhuman in the accepted sense as his own, and puzzled upon the origin of the one who would allow himself to be called nothing but Captain. As if at the Captain's summons, the mist drew itself about the ship again, as a woman might draw a froth of furs about her body. The Red Star's light faded, but the distant screams continued. Did the captain notice the screams now for the first time, or was this a pantomime of surprise? His blind head tilted, a hand went to his ear. He murmured in a tone of satisfaction, uh, Elric? Here, said the albina, above you. We are almost there, Elric. The apparently fragile hand found the rail of the companionway. The captain began to climb. Elric faced him at the top of the ladder. If it's a battle, the captain's smile was enigmatic, bitter. It was a fight, or shall be one. We'll have no part of it, concluded the albino firmly. It is not one of the battles in which my ship is directly involved. Those whom you can hear are the vanquished lost in some future, which I think you will experience close to the end of your present incarnation. Elric waved a dismissive hand. I'll be glad, Captain, if you would cease such vapid mystification. I'm weary of it. I'm sorry it offends you. I answer literally, according to my instincts. The Captain, going past Elric and Otto Blenker, so he could stand at the rail, seemed to be apologizing. He said nothing for a while, but listened to the disturbing and confused babble from the mist, and then he nodded, apparently satisfied. We'll sight land shortly. If you would disembark and seek your own world, I should advise you to do so now. This is the closest we shall ever come again to your plane. Elric let his anger show. He cursed, invoking Ariok's name, and put a hand upon the blind man's shoulder. What? You cannot return me directly to my own plane? It is too late. The captain's dismay was apparently genuine. The ship sails on. We near the end of our long voyage. But how shall I find my own world? I have no sorcery great enough to move me between the spheres, and demonic assistance is denied me here. There is one gateway to your world. That is why I suggest you disembark. Elsewhere there are none at all. Your sphere and this one intersect directly. But you say this lies in my future? Be sure, you will return to your own time. Here, you are timeless. It is why your memory is so poor. It is why you remember so little of what befalls you. Seek for the gateway. It is crimson and emerges from the sea off the coast of the island. Which island? The one we approach. Elric hesitated. And where shall you go when I have landed? To Tantalon. There is something I must do there. My brother and I must complete our destiny. We carry cargo as well as men. Many will try to stop us now, for they fear our cargo. We might perish, but yet we must do all we can to reach Tanalorn. Was that not then Tanalorn where we fought Agak and Gagak? That was nothing more than a broken dream of Tanalorn, Elric. The Melnibonean knew he would receive no more information from the captain. You offer me a poor choice to sail with you into danger and never see my own world again, or to risk landing on yonder island, inhabited by the sound of it, by the damned, and by those who prey upon the damned. The captain's blind eyes moved in Elric's direction. I know, but it is the best I can offer you nonetheless. The screams, the imploring, terrified shouts were closer now, but there were fewer of them. 
Glancing over the side, Elric thought he saw a pair of armored hands rising from the water. There was foam, red-flecked and noxious, and there was yellow scum in which pieces of frightful flotsam drifted. There were broken timbers, scraps of canvas, tatters of flags and clothing, fragments of weapons, and, increasingly, there were floating corpses. But where was the battle? Blanco whispered, fascinated and horrified by the sight. Not on this plane, the captain told him. You see only wreckage which has drifted from one world to another. Then it was a supernatural battle? The captain smiled again. I am not omniscient, but yes, I believe there were supernatural agencies involved. The warriors of half a world fought in the sea battle to decide the fate of the multiverse. It is, or will be, one of the decisive battles to determine the fate of mankind, to fix man's destiny for the coming cycle. Who were the participants, said Elric, and what were the issues as they understood them? You will know in time, I think. The captain's head faced the sea again. Blenker sniffed the air. Ah, it's foul. Elric, too, found the odor increasingly unpleasant. Here and there now, the water was lighted by guttering fires which revealed the faces of the drowning, some of whom still managed to cling to pieces of blackened driftwood. Not all the faces were human, though they had the appearance of having been once human. Things with the snouts of pigs and of bulls raised twisted hands to the dark ship and grunted plaintively for succor. But the captain ignored them, and the steersman held his course. Fires spluttered and water hissed. Smoke mingled with the mist. Elric had his sleeve over his mouth and nose and was glad the smoke and mist between them helped obscure the sights, for as the wreckage grew thicker, not a few of the corpses he saw reminded him more of reptiles than of men, their pale lizard bellies spilling something other than blood. If that is my future, Elric told the captain, I have a mind to remain on board after all. You have a duty, as have I. The future must be served as much as the past and the present. Elric shook his head. I fled the duties of an empire because I sought freedom, and freedom I must have. No, there is no such thing, not yet, not for us. We must go through much more before we can even begin to guess what freedom is. The price for the knowledge alone is probably higher than you would care to pay at this stage of your life. Indeed, life itself is often the price. I also sought release from metaphysics when I left Mel Libane. I'll get the rest of my gear and take the land that's offered with luck. This crimson gate will be quickly found, and I'll be back among dangers and torments which will at least be familiar. It is the only decision you could have made. The captain's blind head turned towards Blanker. And you, Otto Blanker, what shall you do? Elric's world is not mine, and I like not the sound of those screams. What can you promise me, sir, if I sail on with you? Nothing but a good death. Death is the promise we're all born with, sir. A good death is better than a poor one. I'll sail on with you. As you like. I think you're wise. I'll say farewell to you, then, Elric of Melnibene. You fought well in my service, and I thank you. Fought for what? Elric asked. Oh, call it mankind, call it fate. Call it a dream or an ideal, if you wish. Shall I never have a clearer answer? Not for me. I do not think there is one. You allow a man little faith. Elric began to descend the companionway. There are two kinds of faith, Elric. Like freedom, there is a kind which is easily kept, but proves not worth the keeping. And there is a kind which is hard won. I agree. I offer little of the former. Elric strode toward his cabin. He laughed, feeling genuine affection for the blind man at that moment. I, I thought I had a pension for such ambiguities, but I have met my match in you, Captain. He noticed that the steersman had left his place at the wheel and was swinging out a boat on its davits. 
preparatory to lowering it. Is that for me? The steersman nodded. Elric ducked into his cabin. He was leaving the ship with nothing but that which he had brought aboard, only his clothing and his armor were in a poorer state of repair than they had been, and his mind was in a considerably greater state of confusion. Without hesitation, he gathered up his things, drawing his heavy cloak about him, pulling on his gauntlets, fastening buckles and thongs. Then he left the cabin and returned to the deck. The captain was pointing through the mist at the dark outlines of a coast. Can you see land, Elric? I can. You must go quickly, then. Willingly. Elric swung himself over the rail and into the boat. The boat struck the side of the ship several times, so that the hull boomed like the beating of some huge funeral drum. Otherwise there was silence now on the misty waters, and no sign of wreckage. Blenker saluted him. I wish you luck, comrade. You too, Master Blenker. The boat began to sink towards the flat surface of the sea, the pulleys of the davits creaking. Elric clung to the rope, letting go as the boat hit the water. He stumbled and sat down heavily upon the seat, releasing the rope so the boat drifted at once away from the dark ship. He got out the oars and fitted them into the rowlocks. As he pulled toward the shore, he heard the captain's voice calling to him, but the words were muffled by the mist, and he would never know now if the blind man's last communication had been a warning or merely some formal pleasantry. He did not care. The boat moved smoothly through the water. The mist began to thin, but so too did the light fade. Suddenly he was under a twilight sky, the sun already gone and stars appearing. Before he had reached the shore it was already completely dark with the moon not yet risen, and it was with difficulty that he beached the boat on what seemed flat rocks and stumbled inland until he judged himself safe enough from any inrushing tide. Then, with a sigh, he lay down, thinking just to order his thoughts before moving on. But almost instantly, he was asleep. Dreaming and Waking Elric dreamed. He dreamed not merely of the end of his world, but of the end of an entire cycle in the history of the cosmos. He dreamed that he was not only Elric of Melnibene, but that he was other men too, men who were pledged to some numinous cause which even they could not describe. And he dreamed that he had dreamed of the dark ship and Tantalorn and Agak and Gagak while he lay exhausted upon a beach somewhere beyond the borders of Picarade. And when he woke up, he was smiling sardonically, congratulating himself for the possession of a grandiose imagination. But he could not clear his head entirely of the impression left by that dream. This shore was not the same, so plainly something had befallen him. Perhaps he'd been drugged by slavers, then later abandoned when they found him not what they expected. But no, the explanation would not do. If he could discover his whereabouts, he might also recall the true facts. It was dawn, for certain. He sat up and looked about him. He was sprawled on a dark, sea-washed limestone pavement, cracked in a hundred places, the cracks so deep that the small streams of foaming salt water rushing through these many narrow channels made raucous what would otherwise have been a very still morning. Elric climbed to his feet, using his scabbarded rune sword to steady himself. His bone-white lids closed for a moment over his crimson eyes as he saw it again to recollect the events which had brought him here. He recalled his flight from Picarade, his panic, his falling into a coma of hopelessness, his dreams, and because he was evidently neither dead nor a prisoner, he could at least conclude that his pursuers had, after all, given up the chase, for if they'd found him, they would have killed him. Opening his eyes and casting about him, he marked the peculiar blue quality of the light, doubtless a trick of the sun behind the gray clouds, which made the landscape ghastly and gave the sea a dull, metallic look. The limestone terraces which rose from the sea and stretched above him shone intermittently like polished lead. On an impulse he held his hand to the light and inspected it. The normally lusterless white of his skin was now tinged with a faint, bluish luminosity. He found it pleasing, and smiled as a child might smile in innocent wonder. 
He had expected to be tired, but he now realized he felt unusually refreshed, as if he had slept long after a good meal. And deciding not to question the fact of this fortunate and unlikely gift, he determined to climb the cliffs in the hope he might get some idea of his bearings before he decided which direction he would take. Limestone could be a little treacherous, but it made easy climbing, for there was almost always somewhere that one terrace met another. He climbed carefully and steadily, finding many footholds, and seemed to gain considerable height quite quickly, yet it was noon before he'd reached the top, and found himself standing at the edge of a broad, rocky plateau, which fell away sharply to form a close horizon. Beyond the plateau was only the sky, save for sparse brownish grass, little grew here and there with no signs at all of human habitation. It was now for the first time that Elric realized the absence of any form of wildlife. Not a single seabird flew in the air, not an insect crept through the grass. Instead, there was an enormous silence hanging over the brown plain. Elric was still remarkably untired, so he decided to make the best use he could of his energy and reach the edge of the plateau in the hope that from there he would sight a town or a village. He pressed on, feeling no lack of food and water, and his stride was singularly energetic still. But he had misjudged his distance, and the sun began to set well before his journey to the edge was completed. The sky on all sides turned a deep, velvety blue, and the few clouds that there were in it were also tinged blue, and now, for the first time, Elric realized that the sun itself was not its normal shade, but that it burned blackish purple, and he wondered again if he still dreamed. The ground began to rise sharply, and it was with some effort that he walked, but before the light had completely faded, he was on the steep flank of a hill, descending towards a wide valley, which, though bereft of trees, contained a river which wound through rocks and russet turf and bracken. After a short rest, Elric decided to press on, although night had fallen, and see if he could reach the river, where he might at least drink and possibly in the morning find fish to eat. Again. No moon appeared to aid his progress, and he walked for two or three hours in a darkness which was almost total, stumbling occasionally into large rocks until the ground leveled, and he felt sure he'd reached the floor of the valley. he developed a strong thirst by now and was feeling somewhat hungry, but decided it might be best to wait until morning before seeking the river, when, rounding a particularly tall rock, he saw, with some astonishment, the light of a campfire. Hopefully, this would be the fire of a company of merchants, a trading caravan on its way to some civilized country, which would allow him to travel with it, perhaps in return for his services as a mercenary swordsman. It would not be the first time since he had left Melnibene that he'd earned his bread in such a way. Yet Elric's old instincts did not desert him. He approached the fire cautiously and let no one see him. Beneath an overhang of rock, made shadowy by the flame's light, he stood and observed a group of fifteen or sixteen men, who sat or lay close to the fire, playing some kind of game involving dice and slivers of numbered ivory. Gold, bronze, and silver gleamed in the firelight as the men staked large sums on the fall of the dice or the turn of a slip of ivory. Elric guessed that if they had not been intent on their game, these men must certainly have detected his approach, for they were not, after all, merchants. By the evidence, they were warriors, wearing scarred leather and dented metal, their weapons ready to hand, yet they belonged to no army, unless it be an army of bandits, for they were of all races and, oddly, seemed to be from various periods in the history of the young kingdoms. It was as if they'd looted some scholar's collection of relics. An axeman, of the later Lormirian Republic, which had come to an end some two hundred years ago, lay with his shoulder rubbing the elbow of a Chalalite bowman, from a period roughly contemporary with Elric's own. Close to the Chalalite sat a short Ilmerian infantryman of a century past. Next to him was a Filcarian, in the barbaric dress of that nation's earliest times. Tarkashites, Shazarians, Vilmerians, all mingled, and the only thing they had in common by the look of them was a villainous, hungry cast to their features. In other circumstances, Elric might have skirted this encampment and moved on, but he was so glad to find human beings of any sort, he ignored the disturbing incongruities of the group, yet he remained content to watch them. 
One of the men, less unwholesome than the others, was a bulky, black-bearded, bald-headed sea warrior, clad in the casual leathers and silks of the people of the Purple Towns. It was when this man produced a large gold Melnibonean wheel, a coin not minted as most coins, but carved by craftsmen to a design both ancient and intricate, that Elric's caution was fully conquered by his curiosity. Very few of those coins existed in Melnibone, and none that Elric had heard of outside, for the coins were not used for trade with the young kingdoms. They were prized, even by the nobility of Melnibone. It seemed to Elric that the bald-headed man could only have acquired the coin from another Melnibonean traveler, and Elric knew of no other Melnibonaeans who shared his penchant for exploration. His weariness dismissed, he stepped into the circle. If he had not been completely obsessed by the thought of the Melnibonean wheel, he might have taken some satisfaction in the sudden scuffle to arms which resulted. Within seconds, the majority of the men were on their feet, their weapons drawn. For a moment the gold wheel was forgotten. His hand upon his rune sword's pommel, he presented the other in a placatory gesture. Forgive the interruption, gentlemen. I am but one tired fellow soldier who seeks to join you. I would beg some information and purchase some food if you have it to spare. On foot, the warriors had an even more ruffianly appearance. They grinned among themselves, entertained by Elric's courtesy, but not impressed by it. One, in the feathered helmet of a Pantangian sea chief, with features to match swarthy, sinister, pushed his head forward on its long neck and said banteringly, We've company enough, white face, and few here over fond of the man demons of Melnibone. You must be rich. Elric recalled the animosity with which Melnibonaeans were regarded in the young kingdoms, particularly by those from Pantang, who envied the Dragon Isle, her power and her wisdom and, of late, had begun crudely to imitate Melnibone. Increasingly on his guard, he said evenly, I have a little money. Then we'll take it, demon. The Pantangian presented a dirty palm just below Elric's nose as he growled, Give it over and be on your way. Elric's smile was polite and fastidious, as if he'd been told a poor joke. The Pantangian evidently thought the joke better than did Elric, for he laughed heartily and looked to his nearest fellows for approval. Coarse laughter infected the night, and only the bald-headed, black-bearded man did not join in the jest, but took a step or two back while all the others pressed forward. The Pantangian's face was close to Elric's own. His breath was foul, and Elric saw his beard and hair were alive with lice. Yet he kept his head, replying in the same equable tone. Give me some decent food, a flask of water, some wine if you have it, and I'll gladly give you the money I have. The laughter rose and fell again as Elric continued. But if you would take my money and leave me with naught, then I must defend myself. I have a good sword. The Pantangian strove to imitate Elric's irony. But you will note, Sir Demon, that we outnumber you considerably. Softly, the albino spoke. I have noticed that fact, but I'm not disturbed by it. And he'd drawn the black blade even as he finished speaking, for they had come at him with a rush. And the Pantangian was the first to die, sliced through the side, his vertebrae sheared. And Stormbringer, having taken its first soul, began to sing. A Chalalite died next, leaping with stabbing javelin poised on the point of the rune sword and Stormbringer murmured with pleasure. But it was not until it had sliced the head clean off a Filcarian pikemaster that the sword began to croon and come fully to life, black fire flickering up and down its length, its strange runes glowing. Now the warriors knew they battled sorcery and became more cautious, yet they scarcely paused in their attack, and Elric, thrusting and parrying, hacking and slicing, needed all of the fresh, dark energy the sword passed on to him. Lance, sword, axe, and dirk were blocked. Wounds were given and received. But the dead had not yet outnumbered the living when Elric found himself with his back against the rock and nigh a dozen sharp weapons seeking his vitals. It was at this point, when Elric had become somewhat less than confident that he could best so many, that the bald-headed warrior, 
axe in one gloved hand, sword in the other, came swiftly into the firelight and set upon those of his fellows closest to him. I thank you, sir, Elric was able to shout during the short respite this sudden turn produced. His morale improved, he resumed the attack. The Lormirian was cloven from hip to thigh as he dodged a feint. A Filcarian, who should have been dead four hundred years before, fell with the blood bubbling from his lips and nostrils, and the corpses began to pile one upon the other. Still Stormbringer sang its sinister battle song, and still the rune sword passed its power to its master, so that with every death Elric found strength to slay more of the soldiers. Those who remained now began to express their regret for their hasty attack. Where oaths and threats had issued from their mouths now came plaintive petitions for mercy, and those who had laughed with such bold braggadocio now wept like young girls. But Elric, full of his old battle joy, spared none. Meanwhile, the man from the Purple Towns, unaided by sorcery, put axe and sword to good work and dealt with three more of his one-time comrades, exulting in his work as if he had nursed a taste for it for some time. Yoy, but this is worthwhile slaughter, cried the black-bearded one. And then that busy butchery was suddenly done, and Elric realized that none were left save himself and his new ally, who stood leaning on his axe, panting and grinning like a hound at the kill, replacing a steel skullcap on his pate from where it had fallen during the fight, and wiping a bloody sleeve over the sweat glistening on his brow, and saying in a deep good humor tone, Well now. It is we who are wealthy, all of a sudden. Elric sheathed the Stormbringer, still reluctant to return to its scabbard. You desire their gold? Is that why you aided me? The black-bearded soldier laughed. <laughs> I owed them a debt, and had been biding my time, waiting to pay. These rascals are all that were left of a pirate crew which slew everyone on board my ship when we wandered into strange waters. They would have slain me. Had I not told him I wished to join them, now I am revenged. Not that I am above taking the gold, since much of it belongs to me and my dead brothers. It will go to their wives and their children when I return to the Purple Towns. How did you convince them not to kill you, too? Elric sought among the ruins of the fire for something to eat. He found some cheese and began to chew on it. They had no captain or navigator, it seemed. They were... None were real sailors at all, but coast huggers based upon this island. They were stranded here, you see, and had taken to piracy as a last resort, but were too terrified to risk the open sea. Besides, after the fight, they had no ship. We had managed to sink that as we fought. We sailed mine to this shore, but provisions were already low, and they had no stomach for setting sail without full holds, so I pretended I knew this coast. May the gods take my soul if I ever see it again after this business and offered to lead them inland to a village they might loot. They had heard of no such village, but believe me when I said it lay in a hidden valley. That way I prolonged my life while I waited for the opportunity to be revenged upon them. It was a foolish hope, I know, yet, <laughs> as it happened, it was well-founded after all, eh? The black-bearded man glanced a little warily at Elric, uncertain of what the albino might say. Hoping, however, for comradeship, though it was well known how haughty Melnibonaeans were. Elric could tell all these thoughts went through his new acquaintance's mind. He'd seen many others make similar calculations, so he smiled openly and slapped the man on the shoulder. You saved my life also, my friend. We are both fortunate. The man sighed in relief and slung his axe upon his back. Aye, lucky is the word, but... Shall our luck hold, I wonder? You do not know the island at all? <laughs> Nor the waters, either. How we came to them, I'll never guess. Enchanted waters, though. Without question, you've seen the color of the sun? I have. The seaman bent to remove a pendant from around the Pantangian's throat. Well, you know more about enchantments and sorceries than I. How came you here, Sir Melnibonean? I know not. I fled from some who hunted me. I came to a shore and could flee no further. Then I dreamed a great deal. When I next awoke, I was on the shore again, but of this island. Hmm. Spirits of some sort may, may be friendly to you, took you to safety, away from your enemies. That's just possible. 
for we have many allies among the elementals. I am called Elric, and I am self-exiled from Melnibene. I travel because I believe I have something to learn from the folk of the young kingdoms. I have no power, save what you see. The black-bearded man's eyes narrowed in appraisal as he pointed at himself with his thumb. I'm Smeorgan Baldhead, once a sea lord of the Purple Towns. I commanded a fleet of merchantmen. Perhaps I still do. I shall not know until I return, if I ever do return. Then let us pool our knowledge and our resources, Smeorgan Baldhead, and make plans to leave this island as soon as we can. Elric walked back to where he saw traces of the abandoned game, trampled into the mud and the blood. From among the dice and the ivory slips, the silver and the bronze coins, he found the gold Melnibene and wheel. He picked it up and held it in his outstretched palm. The wheel almost covered the whole palm. In the old days, it had been the currency of kings. This was yours, friend? he asked Smeorgan. Smeorgan Baldhead looked up from where he was still searching the Pantangian for his stolen possessions. He nodded. Aye? Would you keep it as part of your share? Elric shrugged. I'd rather know from whence it came. Who gave it to you? It was not stolen. It's Melnibonean, then? Yes. I guessed it. From whom did you obtain it? Smeorgan straightened up. Having completed his search, he scratched at a slight wound on his forearm. It was used to buy passage on our ship, before we were lost, before the raiders attacked us. Passage? By a Melnibonean? Maybe. He seemed reluctant to speculate. Was he a warrior? Smeorgan smiled in his beard. No. It was a woman that gave that to me. How did she come to take passage? Smeorgan began to pick up the rest of the money. It is a long tale, and in part a familiar one to most merchant sailors. We were seeking new markets for our goods, and had equipped a good-sized fleet which I commanded as the largest shareholder. He seated himself casually upon the big corpse of the Chalalite and began to count the money. Would you hear the tale, or do I bore you already? I'd be glad to listen. Reaching behind him, Smeorgan pulled a wine flask from the belt of the corpse and offered it to Elric, who accepted it and drank sparingly of a wine which was unusually good. Smeorgan took the flask when Elric had finished. That's part of our cargo. We were proud of it. A good vintage, eh? Excellent. So you set off from the Purple Towns? Aye. Going towards the Unknown East. We sailed due east for a couple of weeks, sighting some of the bleakest coasts I have ever seen, and then we saw no land at all for another week. That was when we entered a stretch of water we came to call the Roaring Rocks. Like the serpent's teeth off Shazar's coast, but much greater in expanse and larger too. Huge volcanic cliffs which rose from the sea on every side, and around which the waters heaved and boiled and howled with the fierceness I've rarely experienced. Well, in short, the fleet was dispersed, and at least four ships were lost on those rocks. At last, we were able to escape those waters and found ourselves becalmed and alone. We searched for our sister ships for a while and then decided to give ourselves another week before turning for home. We had no liking to go back into the Roaring Rocks again. Low on provisions, we sighted land at last, grassy cliffs and hospitable beaches, and inland some signs of cultivation, so we knew we had found civilization again. We put into a small fishing port and satisfied the natives, who spoke no tongue used by us in the young kingdoms, that we were friendly. And that was when the woman approached us. The Melnibonean woman? If Melnibonean she was, she was a fine-looking woman, I'll say that. We were short of provisions, as I told you, and short of any means of purchasing them, for the fishermen desired little of what we had to trade. Having given up our original quest, we were content to head westward again. The woman. She wished to buy passage to the young kingdoms, and was content to go with us as far as Menna, her home port. For her passage, she gave us two of those wheels. One was used to buy provisions in the town. A dragon, I think it was called. And after making repairs, we set off again. You never reached the Purple Towns. 
There were many storms, strange storms. Our instruments were useless. Our lodestones were of no help to us at all. We became even more completely lost than before. Some of my men argued we had gone beyond our own world altogether. Some blamed the woman, saying she was a sorceress who had no intention of going to Manai. But I believed her. Night fell and seemed to last forever, until we sailed into a calm dawn beneath a blue sun. My men were close to panic. It take much to make my men panic when we sighted the island. As we headed for it, those pirates attacked us. In a ship which belonged to history, it should have been at the bottom of the ocean, not on the surface. I've seen pictures of such craft in murals on a temple wall in Tarkesh. In ramming us, she stove in half her port side and was sinking even when they swarmed aboard. They were desperate, savage men, Elric, half-starved and blood-hungry. We were weary after our voyage, but fought well. During the fighting, the woman disappeared, killed herself, maybe, when she saw the stamp of our conquerors. After a long fight, only myself and one other who died soon after were left. That was when I became cunning and decided to wait for revenge. The woman had a name, and she would give... I thought the matter over and suspect that, after all, we were used by her. Perhaps she did not seek men in the young kingdoms. Perhaps it was this world she sought and by sorcery led us here. This world? You think it different from our own? If only because of the sun's strange color, do you not think so too? You, with your Melnibonean knowledge of such things, must believe it. I have dreamed of such things. Elric admitted, but he would say no more. Most of the pirates thought, as I, they were from all ages of the young kingdoms. That much I discovered. Some were from the earliest years of the era, some from our own time, and some were from the future. Adventurers, most of them, who at some stage of their lives sought a legendary land of great riches which lay on the other side of an ancient gateway, rising from the middle of the ocean, but... They found themselves trapped here, unable to sail back through this mysterious gate. Others had been involved in sea fights, thought themselves drowned, and woken up on the shores of this island. Many, I suppose, at once had reasonable virtues, but there's little to support life on the island. They'd become wolves, living off one another, or any ship unfortunate enough to pass inadvertently through this gate of theirs. Elric recalled part of his dream. Did they call it the Crimson Gate? Several did, aye. And yet the theory is unlikely, if you'll forgive my skepticism, as one who passed through the Shade Gate to a mirror. You know of other worlds, then? I've never heard of this one, and I am versed in such matters. That is why I doubt the reasoning, and yet there was the dream. Dream? Oh... It was nothing. I am used to such dreams and give them no significance. The theory cannot seem surprising to a Melnibonean Elric. Smeorgan grinned again. It is I who should be skeptical, not you. And Elric replied half to himself. Perhaps I fear the implications more. He lifted his head and with the shaft of a broken spear began to poke at the fire. Certain ancient sorcerers of Melnibene proposed that an infinite number of worlds coexist with our own. Indeed, my dreams of late have hinted as much. He forced himself to smile. <laughs> but I cannot afford to believe such things. Thus, I reject them. Wait for the dawn. The color of the sun shall prove the theory. Perhaps it will prove only that we both dream. The smell of death was strong in Elric's nostrils. He pushed aside those corpses nearest to the fire and settled himself to sleep. Smeorgan Baldhead had begun to sing a strong yet lilting song in his own dialect, which Elric could scarcely follow. Do you sing of your victory over your enemies? Smeorgan paused, half amused. No, Sir Elric, I sing to keep the shades at bay. After all, these fellows' ghosts must still be lurking nearby in the dark. So little time has passed since they died. Fear not. Their souls are already eaten. But Smeorgan sang on, and his voice was louder, his song more intense than it ever had been before. 
Just before he fell asleep, Elric thought he heard a horse whinny, and he meant to ask Smeorgan if any of the pirates had been mounted. But he fell asleep before he could do so. Chapter 3 Some Evidence of Sorcery Recalling little of his voyage on the dark ship, Elric would never know how he came to reach the world in which he now found himself. In later years, he would recall most of these experiences as dreams, and indeed they seemed dreamlike even as they occurred. He slept uneasily, and in the morning the clouds were heavier, shining with that strange, leaden light, though the sun itself was obscured. Smeorgan, bald head of the purple towns, was pointing upward, already on his feet, speaking with quiet triumph. Will that evidence suffice to convince you, Elric of Melnibone? I am convinced of a quality about the light, possibly about this terrain which makes the sun appear blue. Elric glanced with distaste around him at the carnage. The corpses made a wretched sight, and he was filled with a nebulous misery that was neither remorse nor pity. Smeorgan's sigh was sardonic. Well, sir skeptic, we had best retrace my steps and seek my ship. What say you? I agree. How far had you marched from the coast when you found us? Elric told him. Smeorgan smiled. You arrived in the nick of time, then. I should have been most embarrassed by today if the sea had been reached and I could show my pirate friends no village. I shall not forget this favor you have done me, Elric. I am a count of the Purple Towns and have much influence. If there is any service I can perform for you when we return, you must let me know. I thank you. But first, we must discover a means of escape. Smeorgan had gathered up a satchel of food, some water, and some wine. Elric had no stomach to make his breakfast among the dead, so he slung the satchel over his shoulder. I'm ready. Come, we go this way. Elric began to follow the Sea Lord over the dry, crunching turf. The steep sides of the valley loomed over them, tinged with a peculiar and unpleasant greenish hue, the result of the brown foliage being stained by the blue light from above. When they reached the river, which was narrow and ran rapidly through boulders, giving easy means of crossing, they rested and ate. Both men were stiff from the previous night's fighting. Both were glad to wash the dried blood and mud from their bodies in the water. Refreshed, the pair climbed over the boulders and left the river behind, ascending the slopes, speaking little so that their breath was saved for the exertion. It was noon by the time they reached the top of the valley and observed a plain not unlike the one which Elric had first crossed. Elric now had a fair idea of the island's geography. It resembled the top of a mountain, with an indentation near the center of which was the valley. Again, he became sharply aware of the absence of any wildlife and remarked on this to Count Smeorgan, who agreed he'd not seen anything, no bird, fish, nor beast since he arrived. It's a barren little world, friend Elric, and a misfortune for a mariner to be wrecked upon its shores. They moved on until the sea could be observed meeting the horizon in the far distance. It was Elric who first heard the sound behind him, recognizing the steady thump of hoofs of a galloping horse, but when he looked back over his shoulder, he could see no sign of a rider nor anywhere that a rider could hide. He guessed that in his tiredness his ears were betraying him. It had been thunder that he heard. Smeorgan strode implacably onward, though he too must have heard the sound. Again it came. Again Elric turned. Again he saw nothing. Smeorgan, did you hear a rider? Smeorgan continued to walk without looking back. I heard. You've heard it before. Many times since I arrived, the pirates heard it too, and some believed it their nemesis, an angel of death, seeking them out for retribution. You don't know the source. Smeorgan paused and then stopped, and when he turned his face was grim. Once or twice I have caught glimpse of a horse, I think, a tall horse, white, richly dressed, but with no man upon his back. Ignore it, Elric, as I do. We have larger mysteries with which to occupy our minds. You are afraid of it, Smeorgan? Aye. I confess it, but neither fear nor speculation will rid us of it. Come. Elric was bound to see the sense of Smeorgan's statement, and he accepted it, 
yet when the sound came again about an hour later, he could not resist turning. Then he thought he glimpsed the outline of a large stallion, outfitted for riding, but that might have been nothing more than an idea Smeorgan had put in his mind. The day grew colder and in the air was a peculiar bitter odor. Elric remarked on the smell to Count Smeorgan and learned that this too was familiar. The smell comes and goes, but it is usually here in some string. Like sulfur. Count Smeorgan's laugh had much irony in it, as if Elric made reference to some private joke of Smeorgan's own. <laughs> Why? <laughs> sulfur, right enough. The drumming of hooves grew louder behind them as they neared the coast, and at last Elric and Smeorgan too turned around again to look. And now a horse could be seen plainly, riderless but saddled and bridled, its dark eyes intelligent, its beautiful white head held proudly. Are you still convinced of the absence of sorcery here, Sir Elric? The horse was invisible, now it is visible. He shrugged the battle axe on his shoulder into a better position. Either that, or it moves from one world to another with ease, so that all we mainly hear are its hoofbeats. If so, it might bear us back to our own world. You admit, then, that we are maroon in some limbo? Very well. Yes, I admit the possibility. There have you no horse sorcery to trap the horse? Sorcery does not come so easily to me for I have no great liking for it. As they spoke, they approached the horse, but it would let them get no closer. It snorted and moved backwards, keeping the same distance between them and itself. At last, Elric said, We waste time, Count Smeorgan. Let's get on to your ship with speed and forget blue suns and enchanted horses as quickly as we may. Once aboard the ship, I can doubtless help you with a little incantation or two, for we'll need aid of some sort if we were to sail a large ship by ourselves. They marched on, but the horse continued to follow them. They came to the edge of the cliffs, standing high above a narrow, rocky bay in which a battered ship lay at anchor. The ship had the high, fine lines of a purple town's merchantman, but its decks were piled with shreds of torn canvas, pieces of broken rope, shards of timber, torn open bales of cloth, smashed wine jars, and all manner of other refuse while in several places her rails were smashed and two or three of her yards had splintered. It was evident she had been through both storms and sea fights, and it was a wonder she still floated. We'll have to tidy her up as best we can, using only the mainsail for motion. Hopefully we can salvage enough food to last us. Look, Elric pointed, sure that he'd seen someone in the shadows near the afterdeck. Did the pirates leave behind any of their company? None. Did you see anyone on the ship just then? My eyes play filthy tricks on my mind. It's this damn blue light. There was a rat or two aboard, that's all. And that's what you saw. Possibly. Elric looked back. The horse appeared to be unaware of them as it cropped the brown grass. Well, let's finish the journey. They scrambled down the steeply sloping cliff face and were soon on the shore, wading through the shallows for the ship clambering up the slippery ropes which still hung over the sides, and at last, setting their feet with some relief upon the deck. I feel more secure already. This ship was my home for so long. He searched through the scattered cargo until he found an unbroken wine jar, carved off the seal, and handed it to Elric. Elric lifted the heavy jar and let a little of the good wine flow into his mouth. As Count Smeorgan began to drink, Elric was sure he saw another movement near the afterdeck, and he moved closer. Now he was certain that he heard strained, rapid breathing, like the breathing of one who sought to stifle his need for air rather than be detected. They were slight sounds, but the albino's ears, unlike his eyes, were sharp. His hand ready to draw his sword, he stalked toward the source of the sound, Smeorgan now behind him. She emerged from her hiding place before he reached her. Her hair hung in heavy, dirty coils about her pale face. Her shoulders were slumped, and her soft arms hung limply at her sides, and her dress was stained and ripped. As Elric approached, she fell on her knees before him. Take my life, but I beg you, do not take me back to Saxif de Anne, though I know you must be his servant or his kinsman. 
It is she. It is our passenger. She must have been in hiding all this time. Elric stepped forward, lifting up the girl's chin so he could study her face. There was a Melnibonean cast about her features, but she was, to his mind, of the young kingdoms. She lacked the pride of a Melnibonean woman, too. What name was that you used, girl? Did you speak of Saxif de An? Earl Saxif de An of Melnibone? I did, my lord. Do not fear me as his servant. And as for being a kinsman, I suppose you could call me that on my mother's side, or rather, my great-grandmother's side. He was an ancestor. He must have been dead for two centuries at least. No, he lives, my lord. On this island? This island is not his home, but it is in this plain that he exists. I sought to escape him through the Crimson Gate. I fled through the gate in a skip. Reached the town where you found me, Counts me Organ, but he drew me back once I was aboard your ship. He drew me back and the ship with me. For that, I have remorse. And for what befell your crew, now I know he seeks me. I can feel his presence growing nearer. Is he invisible? Does he ride a white horse? You see, he is near. Why else should the horse appear on this island? He rides it? Elric gasped. No, no, he fears the horse almost as much as I fear him. The horse pursues him. Elric produced the Melnibonean gold wheel from his purse. Did you take this from the Earl Saxif de Ahn? I did. The albino frowned. Who is this man? You describe him as an ancestor, yet he lives in this world. What do you know of him? Elric weighed the large gold wheel in his hand before replacing it in his pouch. He was something of a legend in Melnibone. His story is part of our literature. He was a great sorcerer, one of the greatest, and he fell in love. It's rare enough for Melnibonaeans to fall in love as... Others understand the emotion, but rarer for one to have such feelings for a girl who was not even one of our own race. She was half Melnibonean, so I heard, from a land which was, in those days, a Melnibonean possession, a western province close to Darjar. She was bought by him in a bunch of slaves he planned to use for some sorceress experiment, but he singled her out, saving her from whatever fate it was the others suffered. He lavished his attention upon her, giving her everything. For her, he abandoned his practices, retired to live quietly away from Imrir, and I think she showed him a certain affection, although she did not seem to love him. There was another, you see, called Karolak, as I recall, also half Melnibonean, who had become a mercenary in Shazar, and risen in the favor of the Shazarian court. She'd been pledged to this Karolak before her abduction. She loved him? She was pledged to marry him, but let me finish my story. But at length, Karolak, now a man of some substance, second only to the king and Shazar, heard of her fate and swore to rescue her. He came with raiders to Melnibonay's shores, and aided by sorcery, sought out Saxif de An's palace. That done, he sought the girl, finding her at last in the apartment Saxif de An had set aside for her use. He told her he'd come to claim her as his bride, to rescue her from persecution. Oddly, the girl resisted, suggesting that she had been too long a slave in the Melnibonean harem to readapt to the life of a princess in the Shazarian court. Karolak scoffed at this and seized her. He managed to escape the castle and had the girl over the saddle of his horse and was about to rejoin his men on the coast when Saxif de An detected them. Karolak, I think, was slain or else a spell was put upon him. But Saxif de An, in his terrible jealousy, and certain the girl had planned the escape with a lover, ordered her to die upon the wheel of chaos, a machine rather like that coin in design. Her limbs were broken slowly, and Saxif de An sat and watched through long days while she died. Her skin was peeled from her flesh, and Earl Saxif de An observed every detail of her punishment. Soon it was evident that the drugs and sorcery used to sustain her life were failing, and Saxif de An ordered her taken from the wheel and laid upon a couch. Well, he said, 
You have been punished for betraying me, and I am glad now you may die. And he saw that her lips, blood-caked and frightful, were moving, and he bent to hear her words. Those words, revenge, an oath? Her last gesture was an attempt to embrace him, and the words were those that she had never uttered to him before, much as he had hoped that she would. And then she died. Gods, what then? What did your ancestor do? He knew remorse. Of course. Not so for a Melnibonean. Remorse is a rare emotion with us. Few have ever experienced it. Torn by guilt, Earl Saxif Don left Melnibone never to return. It was assumed he had died in some remote land, trying to make amends for what he'd done to the only creature he'd ever loved. But now, it seems, he sought the Crimson Gate, perhaps thinking it an opening into hell. But why should he plague me? I am not she. My name is Vasilis. I'm a merchant's daughter from Harkur. I was voyaging to visit my uncle in Vilmir when our ship was wrecked. A few of us escaped in an open boat. More storms seized us. I was flung from the boat and was drowning when... when his galley found me. I was grateful. And then... What happened? Elric pushed the matted hair away from her face and offered her some of their wine. She drank gratefully. He took me to his palace and told me that he would marry me, that I should be his empress forever and rule beside him, but I was frightened. There was such pain in him and such cruelty, too. I, I thought he must devour me, destroy me. Soon after my capture, I took the money in the boat and fled for the gateway, which he had told me about. You could find this gateway for us? I think so. I have some knowledge of seamanship learned from my father, but... What would be the use, sir? He would find us again and drag us back, and he must be very near, even now. I have a little sorcery myself, and will pit it against Saxif Don's if I must. Elric turned to Count Smeorgan. Can we get a sail aloft quickly? Fairly quickly. Then let's hurry, Count Smeorgan, bald head. I might have the means of getting us through this crimson gate and free from any further involvement in the dealings of the dead. Chapter 4 Visit of a White Horse While Count Smeorgan and Vasilis of Harcour watched, Elric lowered himself to the deck, panting and pale. His first attempt to work sorcery in this world had failed and had exhausted him. I am further convinced that we are in another plane of existence, for I should have worked my incantations with less effort. You have failed? Elric rose with some difficulty. I shall try again. He turned his white face skyward. He closed his eyes. He stretched out his arms and his body tensed as he began the incantation again, his voice growing louder and louder, higher and higher, so that it resembled the shrieking of a gale. He forgot where he was. He forgot his own identity. He forgot those who were with him as his whole mind concentrated upon the summoning. He sent his call out beyond the confines of the world, into that strange plain where the elementals dwelled, where the powerful creatures of the air could still be found, the sylphs of the breeze, the sharnas who lived in the storms, and the most powerful of all, the harshans, creatures of the whirlwind. And now... At last, some of them began to come at his summons, ready to serve him, as, by virtue of an ancient pact, the elementals had served his forefathers. And slowly the sail of the ship began to fill, and the timbers creaked, and Smeorgan raised the anchor, and the ship was sailing away from the island through the rocky gap of the harbor and out into the open sea, still beneath a strange blue sun. Soon a huge wave was forming around them, lifting up the ship, and carrying it across the ocean, so that Count Smeorgan and the girl marveled at the speed of their progress, while Elric, his crimson eyes open now but blank and unseeing, continued to croon to his unseen allies. Thus the ship progressed across the waters of the sea, and at last the island was out of sight, and the girl, checking their position against the position of the sun, was able to give Count Smeorgan sufficient information for him to steer a course. As soon as he could, Count Smeorgan went up to Elric, who straddled the deck, still as stiff-limbed as before, and shook him. 
Elric, you will kill yourself with this effort. We need your friends no longer. At once the wind dropped and the wave dispersed, and Elric, gasping, fell to the deck. It is harder here. It is so much harder here. It is as if I have to call across far greater gulfs than any I've known before. And then Elric slept. He lay in a warm bunk in a cool cabin. Through the porthole filtered diffused blue light. He sniffed. He caught the odor of hot food and, turning his head, saw that Vasilis stood there, a bowl of broth in her hands. I was able to cook this. It will improve your health. As far as I can tell, we are nearing the Crimson Gate. The seas are always rough around the gate, so you will need your strength. Elric thanked her pleasantly and began to eat the broth as she watched him. You are very like Saxif Dan, yet harder in a way, and gentler, too. He's so remote. I know why that girl could never tell him she loved him. Elric smiled. Oh, it's nothing more than a folk tale, probably, the story I told you. This Saxif Dan could be another person altogether, or an imposter, even, who's taken his name. Or a sorcerer. Some sorcerers take the names of other sorcerers, for they think it gives them more power. There came a cry from above, but Elric could not make out the words. The girl's expression became alarmed. Without a word to Elric, she hurried from the cabin. Elric, rising unsteadily, followed her up the companionway. Count Smeorgan Baldhead was at the wheel of his ship, and he was pointing toward the horizon behind them. What do you make of that, Elric? Elric peered at the horizon, but could see nothing. Often his eyes were weak, as now, but the girl said in a voice of quiet despair, It is a golden sail. You recognize it? Oh, indeed I do. It is the galleon of Earl Saxif Dawn, his foundess. Perhaps he was lying in wait along our route, knowing we must come this way. How far are we from the gate? I'm not sure. At that moment there came a terrible noise from below, as if something sought to stave in the timbers of the ship. It's in the forward hatches. See what it is, friend Elric, but take care. Cautiously Elric prized back one of the hatch covers and peered into the murky fastness of the hold. The noise of stamping and thumping continued on, and as his eyes adjusted to the light, he saw the source. The white horse was there. It whinnied as it saw him almost in greeting. How did it come aboard? I saw nothing. I heard nothing. The girl was almost as white as Elric. She sank to her knees beside the hatch, burying her face in her arms. He has us. He has us. There is still a chance we can reach the Crimson Gate in time. And once in my own world, why, I can work much stronger sorcery to protect us. No. It is too late. Why else would the white horse be here? He knows that Saxif Don must soon board us. He'll have to fight us before he shall have you, Elwood promised her. You have not seen his men. Cutthroats, all desperate and wolfish. They'll show you no mercy. You would be best advised to hand me over to Saxif Don at once and save yourselves. You'll gain nothing from trying to protect me. But I'd ask you a favor. What's that? Find me a small knife to carry, that I may kill myself as soon as I know you two are safe. Elric laughed, dragging her to her feet. <laughs> I'll have no such melodramatics from you, lass. We stand together. Perhaps we can bargain with Saxifta. What do you have to barter? Very little, but he is not aware of that. He can read your thoughts, seemingly. He has great powers. I am Elric of Melnibane. I am said to possess a certain facility in the sorcerer's arts myself. But you are not as single-minded as Saxif Don. Only one thing obsesses him, the need to make me his consort. Many girls would be flattered by the attention, glad to be an empress with a Melnibanean emperor for a husband. That is why I fear him so. If I lost my determination for a moment, I could love him. I should be destroyed. 
is what she must have known. Chapter 5 A Melnibonean Nobleman The gleaming galleon sails and sides all gilded, so that it seemed the sun itself pursued them, moved rapidly upon them, while the girl and Count Smeorgan watched aghast, and Elric desperately attempted to recall his elemental allies without success. Through the pale blue light, the golden ship sailed relentlessly in their wake. Its proportions were monstrous, its sense of power vast, its gigantic prow sending up huge, foamy waves on both sides as it sped silently towards them. With the look of a man preparing himself to meet death, Count Smeorgan Baldhead of the Purple Towns unslung his battle-axe and loosened his sword in its scabbard, setting his little metal cap upon his bald pate. The girl made no sound, no movement at all, but she wept. Elric shook his head, and his long, milk-white hair formed a halo around his face for a moment. His moody, crimson eyes began to focus on the world around him. He recognized the ship. It was of a pattern with the golden battle barges of Melnibone, doubtless the ship in which the Earl Saxifdan had fled his homeland, searching for the Crimson Gate. Now Elric was convinced that this must be the same Saxifdan, and he knew less fear than did his companions but considerably greater curiosity. Indeed, it was almost with nostalgia he noted the ball of fire like a natural comet, glowing with green light, come hissing and spluttering towards them, flung by the ship's forward catapult. He half expected to see a great dragon wheeling in the sky overhead, for it was with dragons and gilded battlecraft like these that Melnibone had once conquered the world. The fireball fell into the sea a few inches from their bow, and was evidently placed there deliberately as a warning. Don't stop, cried Vasilis. Let the flames slay us, it will be better. Smeorgan was looking upward. We have no choice, look. He has banished the wind, it seems. They were becalmed. Elric smiled a grim smile. He knew now what the folk of the young kingdoms must have felt when his ancestors had used these identical tactics against them. Elric, are these your people? That ship's Melnibone and without question. So are the methods. I am of the blood royal of Melnibone. I could be emperor even now if I chose to claim my throne. There is some small chance that Earl Saxif Don, though an ancestor, will recognize me and therefore recognize my authority. We are a conservative people, the folk of the Dragon Isle. The girl spoke through dry lips hopelessly. He recognizes only the authority of the Lords of Chaos, who give him aid. All Melnibonaeans recognize that authority. From the Ford hatch, the sound of the stallion's stamping and snorting increased. We are besieged by enchantments. Have you none of your own, Prince Elric, you can use to counter them? None, it seems. The golden ship loomed over them. Elric saw that the rails high overhead were crowded, not with Imrerian warriors, but with cutthroats equally as desperate as those he'd fought on the island, and, apparently, drawn from the same variety of historical periods and nations. The galleon's long sweep scraped the sides of the smaller vessel as they folded, like the legs of some water insect, to enable the grappling irons to be flung out. Iron claws bit into the timbers of the little ship, and the brigandly crowd overhead cheered, grinning at them, menacing them with their weapons. The girl began to run to the seaward side of the ship, but Elric caught her by the arm. Do not stop me, I beg you. Rather jump with me and drown. You think that death will save you from Saxif Don? If he has the power you say, death will only bring you more firmly into his grasp. Oh! The girl shuddered, and then, as a voice called down to them from one of the tall decks of the gilded ship, she gave a moan and fainted into Elric's arms, so that weakened as he was by his spell working, it was all he could do to stop himself falling with her to the deck. The voice rose over the coarse shouts and guffaws of the crew. It was pure, lilting and sardonic. It was the voice of a Melnibonean, though it spoke the common tongue of the young kingdoms, 
a corruption in itself of the speech of the bright empire. May I have the captain's permission to come aboard? Count Smeorgan growled back. You have us firm, sir. Don't try to disguise an act of piracy with that polite speech. I take it I have your permission, then. The unseen speaker's tone remained the same. Elric watched as part of the rail was drawn back to allow a gangplank, studded with golden nails to give firmer footing, to be lowered from the galleon's deck to theirs. <laughs> 